And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. famous Go Farther Gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the whistler's strange story, The Go-Between. The conversation in the parked car matched the surroundings. Low, quiet, ominous. In keeping with the isolated, low-lying strip of marsh and dark trees some miles from any main thoroughfare. The driver of the car didn't look at his companion as he spoke. He was staring at the gun in his hand, the flat, cold automatic. He kept turning it over as if something were very strange and unfamiliar to him. Something that he wasn't sure he could use. The girl's eyes weren't on the gun, but on him. And there was a strange look in her eyes. Something not at all easy to define. Love, perhaps. But quite possibly, pity. You, uh... You don't want to do it, Charles. You don't want to kill Ellen. Of course I don't want to kill my wife. But I realize it's the only thing to do. You do love me, don't you, Charles? Of course, Martha. (laughs) Darling. But hiding in back alleys, country lanes, stealing minutes and hours. It isn't very pleasant, is it? No. No, it isn't. Sometimes at the office when when Ellen comes down there and you have to smile as my secretary and show her in. Oh, I don't mind, Charles. But I do. I want to tell her you're not just my secretary, that I love you. Charles, could we just go away together? Forget everything else? And live on what? Ellen's money isn't everything. We've done pretty well so far. I don't know. We could manage. You can do anything you really want to, Charles. Oh, no. Not with the knowledge that we're passing up something as easy as this has been. Well, it hasn't been easy for me. But it's been worthwhile, I'll admit. You know, it's, it's funny how Ellen came through. First time you made that blackmail demand on her. Not so funny. She had a lot to lose. If, uh, if you, if she dies, that will fix everything, won't it? Sure. Everything. All her money goes to me. Good way for it to end. Perfect. If I've actually got the nerve to go through with it. Charles, I, I think we should get back to town. Yeah, back to town. Back to my dear, sweet wife, Ellen. Yes, Charles, back to town and your wife, Ellen. You drive the car swiftly, recklessly over the narrow country lane until it reaches the main highway. Then ride in comparative silence all the way to Malibu and Martha's cottage. When you drop her off, her eyes still have that confused, wondering look. She's thinking about Ellen, isn't she, Charles? Wondering if you'll go through with it. 
Realizing what she's thinking gives you an odd sensation. You wonder what your secretary, Martha Stone, would think if she knew what was really on your mind, if she knew all the details of your situation with Ellen. Back in town, your own home, the lights are still on in the library as you let yourself in and confront Ellen, who's been waiting up for you. Well? I... I couldn't do it, Ellen. I... I just couldn't kill Martha. Couldn't do it? What's the matter with you? Did you lose your nerve? I, I don't know. I'm not sure it's a matter of nerve alone, Ellen. To kill... Well, a man doesn't pick up a gun and blast. He's got to hate. And you don't? Certainly not that much. You're too soft, Charles. Really, this has to end. Martha can't go on blackmailing me forever. I won't go on paying. It's a strange position. It's funny. I fail to see the humor of it, Charles. You say you love me. I do. I was decent enough to admit to you that the girl is blackmailing me. I I told you why. Sure. You told me. Lake Tahoe, two years ago. Wealthy playboy killed. Mystery woman vanishes. You. It was an accident. Are you sorry now that I told you? Sorry I let you play up to Martha? What about our plans, Charles? Your plans for getting rid of her, for good? I, I, I don't know, Ellen. I, I've got to have more time, more time to think. How about what? How about the fact that you're falling in love with your secretary? That I don't count anymore? Don't talk like a fool, Ellen. You know that isn't true. I've been in love with you from the moment we met. I'll always be in love with you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. You know I didn't, but... But, darling, you said... I know what I said, that I'd get Martha out of the way. I said I'd kill her for you. It's the only way, Charles. The only way to stop what she's doing to me, to us. We can't go to the police. She'd tell everything she knew. You've got to kill her. Yes. Yes, Eleanor. I guess it's the only way to stop Martha. And I will. Tomorrow night. I will. Tonight's $20 signal gasoline book goes to Major Robert Hemphill of Hamilton, California for this limerick. A sprightly old lady said, Brother... Use the go-farther gas and no other. When asked why it was, she said, It's because I happen to be Whistler's mother. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with go-farther gasoline. <laughs> of course, Major Hemphill should have said the Whistler's mother. But any mother's advice is good advice because mother knows best. For over 20 years, mother has seen signal gasoline grow more and more famous for mileage. And Mother also knows that Signal's efficient performance, which makes possible that good mileage, also assures you plenty of pickup and power, plus quick cold weather starting. So next time you need gasoline, just remember what the Whistler's mother said. With Signal, the go-farther gas, you're always ahead. Charles, your peculiar position as a go-between and sharer in the blackmail money paid by your wife has brought you to an interesting but grim choice, hasn't it? You've cultivated your secretary, Martha Stone, to the point where she's in love with you. And there have been moments when, in spite of what she was doing to your wife, Ellen, you couldn't help being interested in Martha. But there's still the fact that she is a blackmailer. And besides, if you put her out of the way, Ellen will be eternally grateful. You can ask anything of her, including a loosening of the purse strings, a more generous sharing of her wealth. By the next night, you've decided in Ellen's favor, decided to kill Martha. You slip the forty-five automatic into your pocket, leave the house to keep an appointment with your unsuspecting secretary. At the garage, you realize you've left the house without your overcoat. Walk back into the house yes. to get it. Yes, of and course. Then... Yes, Ralph. Yes, darling just left the house. What? No, I... I 
haven't mentioned the divorce to him yet. Well, I was waiting for... for certain things to clear up. You stand there in the entry hall, stunned, bewildered, until the full meaning of what you're overhearing penetrates your mind. Ellen, your devoted, confiding wife. She's double-crossing you completely, isn't she, Charles? Really using you as a go-between. Talking you into killing your secretary, Martha, to get her out of the way. And at the same time, getting a murder charge to hold over you to make her own plans with someone else completely safe. You walk toward the open library door. And listen to Ellen's concluding yes, words. Yes, darling, yes. Oh, yes, it'll be perfect. We'll have no trouble with Charles, I'm sure. And then... Then we can go anywhere. To the moon together. All right, Ralph. Goodbye. Charles. Yes, Ellen. Charles, your devoted, faithful husband. So I was to be the goat. Your passport to a complete and perfect freedom. No, Charles. No, you, you don't understand. You're I love you. You're stepping stone, Ellen, on the way to the moon. For you and this Ralph. Ralph Jonas, that's it. The artist. Charles, no, please. It's all over, Ellen. For good. All but one thing. You'll never get a divorce because of what I know. Now I'm going to Martha, just as I said I would, but not to kill her, to tell her to go on with it, the blackmail. I want her to bleed you white. Your mind spins wildly as you rush through the night on your way to meet Martha. You're scarcely aware of the night around you, the signposts flashing past. And then, as Martha's cottage looms up in the car's headlights, you tell yourself that this is where you really belong, Charles, with Martha. No matter what she's done or will do to Ellen, she loves you. And you hurry inside and rush forward to take her in your arms as she smiles in greeting you. Martha, oh, Martha. Oh, darling. Darling, what is it? You're trembling. You're shaking. I'm all right, Martha. I'm all right. I'm where I belong now. With you. In the days that follow, you're strangely, blissfully happy, aren't you, Charles? Happy with Martha. Spend your evenings with her. You're not caring what anyone thinks. And all the time, you revel in the fact that she's taking more and more money from your wife. You know Ellen will continue to pay. She can't take the chance of Martha telling about the killing at Lake Tahoe, showing the snapshot of Ellen and the murdered playboy together there. You're amused at what's taking place because you finally learned the meaning of a word you'd sometimes wondered about. The word is hate, isn't it? And you're not at all sure that it won't lead to the next step soon. Murder. Martha keeps asking you when you're going to get rid of Ellen, doesn't she? When everything Ellen has will belong to you, to both of you. And the idea of killing your wife becomes an increasingly attractive thought. And then one afternoon at your office, there's a phone call. Hello, Charles, you old slave. Well, Dad, how are you? Just great, boy, just great. I thought you were still off in the South Sea. Oh, got back yesterday. How have things been going? Oh, pretty well. Sure anxious? Probably will at the cocktail party this afternoon. A uh, uh, cocktail party? Yeah. Weren't you and Ellen invited? Ralph Jonas is having a little fling over at his studio. You know Ralph, don't you, the artist? Uh, well, no. Uh, Ellen does. Well, she'll probably be there. I have a desk loaded with work, Ned. Slave, come on. Do you good to get away. Besides, we have a lot to talk about. Suppose I drop by in ten minutes and pick you up. Well, all right, Ned. Do that. <laughs> In the past few days, you've often wondered about Ralph Jones. Yes, this man that you've never met. The man who has taken your wife, Ellen, from you. Now, here's your chance to find out what he's like. Of course, Ellen will be there. You're counting on that, aren't you, Charles? And you wonder what they'll say and do when you walk in. The studio is exactly as you pictured it, Charles. Cluttered, stuffy, the huge window overlooking the rooftops of the city. As you walk around it, you nod to your friends. Notice the startled expression. 
You notice something else, too. Ellen isn't there. Ned leaves you looking up at a large painting on the wall and hurries off to get you a drink. And then as you stand there, your eyes wandering over the huge canvas. Well, how do you like it? What? Oh. Uh, well, I don't like it either. <laughs> Rubbish, really. Any man who paints like that's a half-wit. Well, I don't know. But I do. I'm the half-wit. <laughs> Ralph Jonas. Oh, I see. I don't believe we've ever met. That's right, we've never met. I'm Charles Grayson. Oh. You didn't expect me. Uh, frankly, no. I knew we'd meet sooner or later, of course, but I was certain it would be in an alley and that you'd probably beat my brains out. Oh, no. No, I don't go in for that sort of thing. You, uh, got something more ingenious in mind, perhaps, huh? No. Nothing at all. Well, uh, I can't say I'm disappointed. <laughs> uh... We're going to let it go, just like that? Why not? Well, I... I don't know. I... I feel I should do something. Uh, apologize. Get you a drink. Invite you to dinner. Somehow, I, I... I feel much better about this whole thing if... You punched me in the nose. Uh, this painting, Mr. Jones. Uh, Ralph, please. Uh, this painting is rather interesting. Oh, you think so? Yes, it... It, uh... Has, uh... Something. That's what one of my critics said. He went on to add that that something was an odor. <laughs> He's right. I'm not very good, you know. Uh, getting back to your wife, Charles. I, uh, I don't see her around here. No. no. She left half an hour ago in one of her moods again. We had a row. She's been very upset lately. Uh, yes, I know. See here, old man. Why won't you give her a divorce? Maybe I'm in love with her. Oh, not really. Are you in love with Ellen? Of course I am. I want to marry her. But I can't wait forever, and I don't intend to. That's what we had the row about. Oh, I see. I can't understand why she simply doesn't divorce you. Simple, really. Mental cruelty or some such hogwash. Is she afraid of you, old man? Ellen? Afraid of me? Well, there must be something, some reason why she won't sue for divorce. Why don't you ask her about it? I already have. She's so vague about it. I... I don't know, Charles. This situation is impossible, really. I... I may have to give up your wife. And all her money, too? Money? <laughs> oh, you think that's it? Oh, my dear fellow, I've got more money of my own than I know what to do with. You mean from uh, this, this sort of thing? The painting? Oh, of course not. It's an inheritance. When my father died, he left me over a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, I see. Did you ever hear of J.P. Jonas? Oh, the fabulous old gentleman. A great example of what a man can accomplish in the good old USA. He started with a small shop, a shoestring. You know what he wound up with? A factory four blocks square, manufacturing... Shoestrings? <laughs> now you've ruined my little joke, John. <laughs> oh, come on, let's get you a drink, yeah? Uh, no, thanks. I, uh, I think I'll be running along. Yeah, but you just got here. Oh, I have some things to do. Well... As you wish. Oh, uh, by the way. Yes? Your wife and I would have lunch tomorrow. When you see her, would you mind telling her I can't make it? You can't help smiling as you leave the studio, can you, Charles? Realize you feel no bitterness toward Ralph Jonas. It's obvious he knows nothing about the blackmail. Obvious, too, that he's becoming tired of waiting for the divorce you'll never give Ellen. In the days that follow, it becomes clear that things aren't going too well between them. One night, as you're about to leave the house, Ralphie. you overhear Ellen on the phone. Ralph, you have to understand. No, no, I can't tell you. Please. You've got to give me time. I know I can work things out, but... But, Ralph... Ralph, I tell you... I... Go right ahead, Ellen. I... Tell us the interrupt. I was just looking for my pipe. Ralph, I'll call you back. Charles, I must talk. To you. Uh, sorry, Ellen, I'm in a hurry. Some other time. But Charles. Here's my pipe. Now, how is Ralph these days? Getting more and more impatient? Charles, we got to talk. Where are you going? Uh, just out. You're going to see Martha, aren't you? And what if I am? Good night. Charles! Charles! Come back! <laughs> Yes. 
You're pleased, aren't you, Charles? As you leave the house and drive downtown to keep your dinner engagement with your friend Ned. It's almost midnight when you return. Swing your car into the driveway and you notice that the garage doors are open. You drive inside. Park your car next to Ellen's yellow convertible. And then as you slip out from behind the wheel. It's about time. What? Ellen, what are you doing here? Waiting for you. Oh? We're going out for a drive. Are we? Where are we going? To Martha's place. Don't be silly. I... Or would you rather I killed you here? Ellen, put that gun away. No, you pushed me just a little too far, Charles. Now I'm going to end things my way. Come along, we're wasting time. Uh, we'll take my car, if you don't mind. And you'll drive. Well, Charles, I'm waiting. <laughs> What's this all about? Mind telling me, Ellen? I told you. I'm going to kill you. Listen, I want... Keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. You sound like you've done this before. I have, Charles. The Lake Tahoe killing wasn't an accident. You think you're going to get away with this? I'm sure of it. In the morning, the police will find you and Martha at the cottage, dead. This gun... Naturally, there'll be questions... I'll say I suspected an affair between the two of you that tonight I overheard you quarreling with someone over the phone that you rushed out of the house with a gun. They'll believe that? I think so. Will Ralph? I'm sure he will. Why are you slowing down? Listen, Ellen, can't we talk this over sensibly? I've made up my mind about this, Charles. Keep going. But, Ellen, let's... I said keep going. Well, suppose... Suppose I agree to let you have a divorce. We'll call it quits. You, you can have your Mr. Jonas. And the blackmail. Will that continue? I'll talk to Martha. She, she'll do what I say. We'll forget the whole thing. No, I can't risk it. I can't risk Ralph finding out about that affair at Lake Tahoe. Sorry, Charles. It's no use, you Charles. Ellen me, Charles. has made up her mind to kill you. you and you can't talk her out of it. But you can act, and soon. Somehow, you've got to get the gun away from her. Then as the car rounds a bend in the road, you slam on the brakes. <laughs> Caught off guard, Ellen falls forward, strikes her head sharply against the dashboard, and then slumps to the floor. You ease her back in the seat, pick up the gun, stare at it. Then at Ellen. It's obvious that you can kill her now easily. And once you've disposed of the body, you'll never have to worry about money again as long as you live. It doesn't take long for you to make up your mind. Does it, child? Warning to drivers. Automobile accidents skyrocket during rainy weather. So if a worn windshield wiper is blurring your vision, or if your tires are dangerously smooth and skiddy, don't put off doing something about it. Better stop at your nearest signal station now. While you wait, your signal dealer can install the famous patented ClearFlex Rainmaster wiper blade. And he can replace your slippery old tires with quick-stopping, skid-resistant new Lee tires. Because the cold rubber in nationally renowned Lee tires is now toughened still further with patented Phil Black O. Today's Lees wear amazingly long. Yet the generous trade-in signal dealers are giving for old tires makes new Lees cost surprisingly little. And liberal credit terms are available. So whatever your car needs for safer winter driving, whether it's tires, batteries, spark plugs, light bulbs, fan belt, or radiator hose, remember your nearest headquarters for a complete line of quality automotive accessories is your nearest signal service station. It's done, isn't it, Charles? Your wife, Ellen, is dead. You've buried her in the lonely canyon not far from Malibu. Carefully covered the spot with underbrush. And you're certain her body will never be found. You return to the car, step on the starter, and begin your drive to Martha's. You're anxious to see her, tell her that it's over, that the future you've planned together is now assured. You reach in your pocket for a cigarette, and your hand touches the murder gun, the gun you took away from Ellen, your wife, before you killed her. 
and realize that in the excitement of burying Ellen, you forgot to dispose of the gun at the same time. For a moment, you're frightened. Then you realize you can easily drop the gun into an even better hiding place, the Pacific Ocean, once you reach Martha Stone's cottage in Malibu. You relax and continue your drive to Martha's. When you arrive, you find the cottage in darkness. Quickly, you unlock the front door, step inside, and then as you turn on the lights... Forget something? What? Who are you? Lieutenant Barlow, police department. Police department? That's right. We thought you might come back, remove the body or something, if you thought you were still in the clear. That's why we had the lights off. Me? But I This is Sergeant Hill. Who are you? My name's Grayson. Charles Grayson. What's happened? Come on in the bedroom. Maybe this will refresh your memory. Uh, Turn on the lights, will you, Sergeant? Right. Martha. Uh Uh-huh. She's dead. Well, what did you come back for? Oh, wait a minute. You, you think that One I... of the neighbors saw that yellow convertible you're driving pull away from here an hour ago. Yeah, but I, I wasn't driving it. My wife, she must... Your wife? Are you saying she killed Martha Stone? Well, no. Well, still, I... Yes, I, I suppose she must have. I... Where is your wife now, Grayson? At home? Yeah, I, I suppose so. That her car, the convertible? Yes. Yes, it is. But you don't know where she is. No, I don't. Not exactly. I think we better all get down to headquarters and talk this over. By the way, Grayson, a forty-five automatic killed Martha Stone. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? Of course not. How, how could I know? I hope not. Because once we find the guy with that forty-five, we found the killer of Martha Stone. Incidentally, Sergeant, you better search Mr. Grayson. Oh, it's just routine, Mr. Grayson. Right, Lieutenant. No. No, no, wait a minute. Go I... ahead, Sergeant. I said frisk him. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine automotive accessories. Remember, if you would like the fun of having your friends hear a limerick of yours on The Whistler, the address to which to send it is the Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles 55, California. All limericks become the property of the Signal Oil Company. Those selected for use on The Whistler will be chosen by our advertising representatives on the basis of humor, suitability, and originality. So, of course, they must be your own composition. Featured in tonight's story were High Averback, Mary Lansing, Hans Conried, and Francis Robinson. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Steve Hampton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Infantile paralysis strikes, you need the help that is supported by the March of Dimes. The March of Dimes needs your help now. Give one dime or as many as you can afford, but give something. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.